And so essentially your, your, your very large banks own it um, and your moderate and good sized banks own it. Um, this is, as you go down, it gets smaller. Um, so you know, your small local bank may or may not own it. Well, and it's so interesting because the bank that I grew up in, Community First Bank, like they had a bank owned life insurance policy now. And it, let me assure you, it was not a multi billion dollar bank, it was a small community bank, but they had that. And I knew nothing about it, but it was different. It was just, I was like, that that's part of what made me start asking questions is like, okay, why are, why is a significant amount of money going into this? This is Better Wealth with Caleb Williams. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of the Better Wealth Podcast. I have the one and only Barry Dykes in the house, and um, this is your second time on the Better Wealth Show. We had such a great response from episode 132. So if you're hearing this guy for the first time, or if you've never heard Pirates of Manhattan, um, or if you've never heard of Barry, uh, Barry Dykes and the work that he's doing, go back to, like, stop this episode, go back, Listen to episode 132. That's where we give all the backstory. And uh, it's crazy to me. It's long, but it's like one of the most listened to podcasts that I've ever done. And and so, Barry, we've gotten a lot of questions about, you know, bank-owned life insurance, about how companies are de-risking their, their risk into life insurance. We've, we're, we're even going to talk about today about how – um, there's an invasion to the passive investor and investing. And I know you're a super big researcher. I want to give you a platform and have a dialogue. So this will be, this will be a, an interesting episode. Um, but I know that there's a lot of people that are, that are dying to listen to this. So thank you so much for making this a priority. Well, th thank you for the opportunity, Caleb. So uh, uh, let's do it. Okay. So one of the things that was so eye-opening to me when I read your book is BOLI. Now, for the person that doesn't know what BOLI stands for, it, it stands for Bank Own Life Insurance. And what's so interesting is banks put a lot of their tier one assets, their safe assets, which I'm hoping you can um, talk a little bit about, into Bank Own Life Insurance. So I know that you have the most recent um, stats on that. I'm wondering if you can walk our listeners through what that even means, why banks do that, and what are the current numbers? Well, you know, it was, it's kind of a, uh, you know, you know, we're both Christians, it's kind of a walk in faith, but uh, um, I, I, I stumbled into this, and this is around 2002, where I, I someone read, I read something in the Wall Street Journal, and this is back in the day when Caleb used to spend five, you to put, spend five bucks for every article he got from the journal in the first day of the internet, but now, uh, but I heard a lot of the, the, uh, the bank's own life insurance, and um, you know, no, you know, so, and I knew it was really one of the only things that worked. And, um, so I just began the research of that book, which the Pirates of Manhattan um, came out in 2007, but any event, um, so, um, just a lot of persistence. I called the companies, insurance companies to ask who, if they'd speak to me about it. I talked to the brokers, they wouldn't speak to me about it. Uh, but just through, uh, you know, prayer, meditation, what have you. Uh, I was eventually able to befriend a, a really nice lady um, at, at the FDIC and um, um, figured out that the banks own more life insurance than anybody combined. And the thing is, to this day, uh, Caleb, and this is true, I've been interviewed by Bloomberg and all this stuff on uh, other uh, media outlets, and they've never disclosed this to the public, and even to this day. And um, so... But the reason why banks buy so much life insurance is because they, they may be crazy people or they may be kind of, we don't like bailing them out. I don't like them bailing up. They're not going to bail out me. They're not going to bail out you. But the point is, is that the, they buy life insurance because they're, because they're no dummies. And, they, and the reason why they buy life insurance is because they get the economics of the product. Uh, it has a guarantee. Um, the, the balance sheet of a life company cannot be leveraged like a bank. Um, can be 10 to 1, you know, normally. And now it's just last 2000, September, last 2000, 2019, September, when the repo market went crazy. Now the banks have no reserves. So life companies are very, very reserved. Okay, they're very, very strong. They can't lever out their money like um, banks do. Uh, the money grows tax deferred. Uh, the money is professionally managed. Um, there's guarantees. You're getting 4% of guaranteed account now. 
I mean, Caleb, a 10 year treasury is like 1.7%. No, a 10 year, a 30 year treasury run 1.7%. 1, 1. So I can get 4% guaranteed in the life company and an additional interest in dividend. Then also it's, you know, it's, it's a very large, there's also, it gives people a very large death benefit and the banks understood that when they get the, uh, the, the when they're the beneficiaries, the money comes into them income tax free. So it's almost like self-fulfilling. It's like you get, you get this asset. This is how I always explain it is you put you, the banks have an asset that they can leverage because they're in the lending institution, but yeah. it also is very safe out will beat a lot of, you know, treasuries, especially now, but yeah. it's also self-fulfilling because they are, the bank is the ultimate beneficiary of the death benefit. And it's like, oh, that makes a ton of sense. Um, and, but a lot of people just don't think about it because they're thinking about life insurance as an expense, not an asset. Okay, so let's give an example. And these, these numbers are accurate and I would testify in court in these. So, so for your listeners out there, so let's, let's look at like the three of the top three banks in the United States. And this, is, this is as of June 30th. Uh, uh, J, JP Morgan Chase has 11.79 billion um, in uh, cash render value in their, in their, on their bully. Bank of America has 22.64 billion. This, this is verifiable. And Wells Fargo or Wells Fraud as I call it sometimes, has 19.15 billion in, in cash surrender value on their balance sheet. Now the death benefit to the, to the banks is roughly, oh, six, six times, six, seven times, okay, of the, of the cash value. So you have Bank of America with the 22 billion, you do the math, 22 times six, what's that? 130 billion, something like that? And death number. benefit? Yeah, it's, it's, it's a big, yeah. big number, yeah. okay? <laughs> now, in addition to that, because it's the, the bank owned life insurance, it's part of their, their, um, their tier one capital. And people should you know, you know, read my books, okay? Uh, Cause I go through this in detail, but tier one capital is the most important asset in the bank. And they can take that like Bank of America with their 22 billion in, in cash rent about, they can lever that up um, legally uh, nine times. And after the repo market uh, imploded last year, um, they can essentially you know, lend an unlimited amount of money on this stuff. So, um, yeah. so it, it's, you know, it's, uh, it's, so it's one of the best assets they can own. And so, it, it come so you're saying that Bank of America as of right now has over, or as of June 30th of last year, has over $22 billion of cash value as their tier one asset. That's a big number. A and big number. you're saying that the death benefit is somewhere around six to seven times, but is not disclosed. Is that correct? No, no, they don't have to disclose it. They just have to disclose yeah. the asset on the balance sheet. Where, how are they funding this? Like, I, I don't, I don't understand. Like, are they, are they finding key people on the bank and it just, all comes together or how, well, how does that work? Well, they used to be able to, they used to insure the entire population of the bank for, so, so something like Bank of America uh, would have know, like 250,000 employees, but I mean, I think it with the regulation is now, but they, they changed that um, to now it's like the top 35% of highly of compensated people at the bank. So they're essentially uh, insuring the, the top one third and they're saying that it's a um, vehicle to fund post-retirement benefits. That's where they, because there has to be an insurable interest, um, but they're buying it really for the pure economics of the whole thing. And then now they're using the bully, but they're also buying, um, you know, uh, split dollar life insurance, yeah. um, things like that to fund ex individual uh, executive retirement plans. So they're buying it really because they get the economic benefits yeah. and it's far superior than a treasury bill, which yeah. is considered the most, the safest bond instrument in the world. Well, in, in other words, they're giving their employees benefits and giving them an incentive to stay while also benefiting the bank. And in a way, they're creating an and asset because it's get, that asset is giving multiple benefits to a bank, which, by the way, a lot of people want to focus solely on rate of return. But what's interesting about banks is they take a step back and say, it's, we'll, we'll, take, we'll take the and approach versus rate of return all day long because they understand the economics. Yeah, and so the thing is, is now also too, as the as the um, the cash value increase um, uh, increases, maybe say five hundred million or whatever year, just because of the growth of the um, that goes that goes right to their income statement. So 
it, it gives it, it improves the valuation for Wall Street. So a penny a share, which doesn't make any sense to you and me, but it makes a big deal to these guys. So, yeah. so they're buying it really for the pure economics of it. And, um, and the, uh, it's probably one of the only places the bank did not lose money in 2008. Yeah. Where, where can people find information about banks? And because it's, it's my understanding that there's over 2000 banks in the U S that have some type of bank owned life insurance. And uh, where no, it's much, it's much higher than that, Caleb. Um, uh, again, this is as, uh, this past September, uh, 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 let's see, uh, 32, 3,300 banks, essentially 3,285 uh, banks and savings associations own bank owned life insurance. So we're at roughly 65% of the, all the, all the banks you see own it in some shape or form. Hmm. Now, the thing is, is, this does not include credit unions. That's right. And there's another product for them. Okay. But I re there's some guys who specialize in that, this, but this is public information. Um, but the key is, is that uh, when you look at the, the scope, I mean, you look at the big banks, they all own it. 80% uh, of the uh, big banks with assets over 10 billion of tier one capital of more than 10 billion, 80% of the banks own it. Uh, banks between notched down between one and 10 billion of assets, 81% of 82% of them own it. And so essentially your, your, your very large banks own it. Um, and your moderate and good sized banks own it. Um, this is, as you go down, it gets smaller. Um, so you know, your small local bank may or may not own it. Well, and uh, it's so interesting because the bank that I grew up in community first bank, like they had a bank owned life insurance policy now. And it, let me assure you, it was not a multi-billion dollar bank it was a small community bank, but they had that. And I knew nothing about it, but it was different. It was just, I was like, that that's part of what made me start asking questions is like, okay, why are, why is a significant amount of money going into this? And it just made me, it made me ask questions for the person that wants to learn more. And you say it's public information. Where can someone find this info? Well, they go to the FDIC, but you have to be kind of a, a nerd like me to dig it out. Um, you know, it's just, uh, it's there. Um, and you know you have to navigate it uh, okay. through call reports. Um, <laughs> you know, but it's just uh, it's 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 there because you and I, you know, <laughs> you and I are behind, Caleb. You and I are behind the FDIC, and, and your listeners out there behind it. Uh, but the uh, but so not so it, it is there. You, you, there's a lot of spade work, and okay. but, you know, and people okay. have individual questions they have. Well, and then I appreciate you doing the work and, and highlighting it for you are the first person that has ever highlighted it for me when I was in this journey of learning. And it just it just gets you to start thinking differently. And the thesis really goes to this. If banks, if the institution of banking is a profitable business, some would say it's the most profitable business out there and they're doing something instead of saying, oh, Bank of America you know, JP Morgan and, and Wells Fargo are awful banks, which I think there's some people that could check the all three of those boxes but they're, they're doing something right. And so it's like, okay, you can like, like be very careful to throw rocks at an institution. Like, yeah, they might, they may not have the best customer service, but there's a reason they're one of the biggest banks, what's got them there. And I think that's, I think we can learn something from that. Anything else in your research of bank owned life insurance and how it works, anything else that is really um, opened your eyes in this journey? How the media will not report this. They won't. They won't. I've been in front of Bloomberg. I know reporters in the journal. I have friends actually in Bloomberg. Some of them are really good people. I mean, I think there's a lot of reporters out there, but they, they, there's really kind of constraints on them to report the truth. And, um, um, you know, uh, that's been kind of a, I thought if I did all this research um, that I would, uh, be rewarded, okay, or uh, become not a celebrity or something like that, you know, because I, I researched this for a number of years, uh, but no, the media still won't uh, re re report it. Why do, why do you think that is? Well, because they don't want to upset their advertisers. You know, it, it, it's, you know, it's, I forget who was some writer from New York who said years ago, freedom of the press belongs to the man who owns the press. And who are the biggest, you know, Cantar Media, which I believe is owned by a private equity firm, believe it or not. Uh, but, you know, the three biggest advertisers um, as a community, I think are, number one are the um, automobile companies and then uh, maybe this, the uh, telephone companies. And then after that, the 
are the asset managers and the banks. Yeah. So, you know, if you if you're running some like CNBC or any of these um, institutions, okay, who are their major advertisers? Yeah, that's good. I mean, listen, I won't even open up other can of worms, but if you actually follow the money, there may be a reason why we hear certain things and and the media chooses not to cover others. It's because don't don't try to expose the person that's feeding you in the begin to begin with. So it's it's a well, interesting observation and you've actually you've been persecuted for your your desire to share the truth yeah and i do one one example another example let, let's look at comcast is a huge where they own nbc yeah. universal and the largest uh uh life insurance policy i ever said paid it was my matter of public record uh was the um uh, um the uh the founding of father of uh Brian Ralph Roberts, who was the the founder of Comcast, he there was a four hundred ninety six million dollar uh, life insurance payment made in four hundred sixty nine four hundred ninety six million or thereabouts over four hundred ridiculous okay crazy made in two thousand sixteen wow and so but you know if you, unless you dig you know you're looking at the proxy statements things like that you're never gonna find that. Well, it's so interesting because I've been I've gone to the FDIC and and tried to find these numbers, and I'm telling you, it is like pulling teeth. It is I, that's why that's it's like honestly, good luck, go try, and and it, it's out there, but it's hard to find, and it takes it takes someone, you know, somewhat determined and maybe a little bit weird to actually lean in um, and 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 go for it. And so thank you for that. Um, I want to I want to go to the next topic. And that's where corporations are de risking. And it's interesting, because you said this before we we started recording, they're de risking and using life insurance companies, which really intrigues me. Um, but I want to ask you this beforehand. Is is it fair to say that every fortune 500 company right now has some type of coli, which stands for corporate owned life insurance, or is that not true anymore? That's not true anymore. I think because most of what you're seeing now, uh, Caleb, it's, it's kind of things shift. I mean, the bank owned life insurance or the corporate owned life insurance was, was a really big uh, thing. But then you had Sarbanes Oxley kind of change a lot of that stuff. So you have legacy st of stuff on that now. So it's really not, it's not that it's still not out there. It's like, if you look at GE's balance sheet, I mean, um, they're still using it in a big way. Uh, but not it's not as um, as much because now they can essentially they they manipulate it with a bigger uh, hammer with you know with stock buybacks, and that's you know so you don't see it as much of the um, the, the corporate owned life or the bank owned life insurance or the corporate owned life insurance you don't see it as much uh, because there's other ways to loot the company. <laughs> you're you're like saying you're saying is it because of regulations or is it because the interest rates are so low? companies are putting their money and buying back their stock instead of putting into corporate owned life insurance. Yeah. They're, they're buying back their own stock. Yeah. <clears throat> so, but the interesting, but the interesting, uh, uh, thing about this is that, um, I said, I started, you know, uh, get, and luckily I subscribed to some pension journals and things like that, which most advisors don't want to spend the money. Um, but I started, re <laughs> started researching this and, um, what I found, is that they, um, these major corporations throughout the United States and in the UK and in Ireland and in Germany, um, and even sometimes in South Africa, um, they're, they're saying, look, it, we have to manage this retirement plan. We give up, okay? You guys handle it. And so, um, so the whole thing is that they're, they're taking something which is around, very difficult to manage, which is if the retail, if it's if a major 500 core, if a fortune 100 company can't manage their retirement plan, how is an individual going to do that? And, you know, I don't have all the answers. Um, you know, the guy upstairs says, but let me give you some examples for your listeners. And this is all true. And uh, I, I think I, I mentioned this. In the, did you get my book, The Guaranteed Income? Yep. yep. So I, I started on this. Yeah, uh, when I restarted researching this, like in 2015, I came up with about 40 companies uh, worldwide, which were using um, life insurance companies to de-risk their retirement plans. And that, well, now I get about three, four hundred. Um, so it's been huge. And um, again, you're not going to hear anything about this in the mainstream media. Um, 
And what, what the, the talk about the media, the media are actually they're hypocrites. Uh, for instance, like New York Times, I, I, knew, I, know, I know some rep reports of the, the Times. Uh, the New York Times has purchased uh, two annuities for $480 million to fund their retirement plan benefits. So for your readers, just, just, just to give you some uh, real truth, um, some, some companies who they know who, who, who does this? Uh, well, General Motors was, was the classic case they bought. In 2012, they bought annuities for roughly 118,000 people in the U.S., are they doing this? Are are they doing this to bail out their pension fund or make their retirement? Well, they to manage to manage the pension fund. Okay, so you're saying you're saying when you first started this, you could find thirty to forty companies, and now there's upwards to three over three hundred companies yeah. that you can see that are taking their their pension fund and use and de-risking it using life insurance companies. Exactly to manage the risk. Right? Yeah. So okay, let's go through that list because that's incredible. So, so this is the whole thing. So, so maybe, uh, you know, so maybe we're doing the guaranteed income coming up like a 2.0, but uh, so companies like General Motors, it's the, it's, it's the 800 pound uh, whale. I mean, that's, uh, they spent close to 30 billion in 2012 to do this. Um, let's see, um, British Airways has spent 13.6 billion. Lloyd's Bank, okay. Um, spent 13 billion in, in the last year on, on longevity swaps, which is a type of annuity. Uh, the uh, Rolls Royce, 33,000 people, uh, they bought annuities for uh, 10 billion. HSBC Bank um, in uh, 2019 spent eight and a half billion. Verizon uh, in 2012, they spent eight billion. Um, let's see other uh, brand names. Um, so my point is, is that they know how to manage uh, project principal. FedEx, six billion. Bristol Myers Squibb, five point four billion. Uh, Marsh Mac uh, in the UK, four point seven billion. Um, BMW, you know, uh, four point two three billion in uh, two thousand and ten. And this uh, other one, Heineken. Everyone, Heineken tastes tremendous. Uh, they they spent 3.6 billion in uh, in 2015. Uh, Motorola in the U.S. They yeah. sort of bought 33.1 billion and and, and uh, put, to, to handle the pension for 30,000 people. Uh, international paper. I mean, it's just where's where's Social Security on that list? <laughs> should, should, would that would that solve a lot of problems if the government actually used private? private there's not, there's not a big enough life insurance company to retain this risk it's like that's one heck of a reinsurance play right there <laughs> so but they know i mean the uh but but the thing is is that uh, what what what, what kind of what kind of blew my mind is that uh, um the the bbc yeah bought a huge annuity like a, a couple months ago itv um independent television network in the uk bought one is it is it because interest rates are so low that they want to buy into the mortality credits or can you explain why the companies are doing this because doing let, me, doing let me let me let me preface it real quick a lot of people say life insurance is terrible a lot of people say annuities are terrible there's a an ria slash fiduciary that i won't who will remain nameless that says annuities are terrible why i feel like that's such a very elementary view and we're all about results why are these companies sinking billions of dollars into what financial gurus are saying are the worst place to put your money? Well, they want to do risk. They, you know, they, the CFOs, they want to say, look, I get this liability in my balance sheet. Who can best manage it? I don't want this job anymore. Yep. Who can do it? A life company can. Yep. You know, and uh, matter of fact, uh, uh, Unisys, the, uh, the big, huge computer company, um, in Pennsylvania, they just bought one this week, and, and I think they're and so, so um, they're doing it because it just makes sense. Yeah. They have the laws of large numbers. Yeah. I mean, and you know, contractually, as we know, in life insurance and annuities, they're, they're better um, a manager of risk. Yeah. Now, to the downside of that, you um, you know, from a retail investor's perspective, there's also a um, which is uh, the, the sub for another. It's been my, my research in the private equity getting into the life insurance business, which really concerns me in a big way, uh, because of the um, um, it's it's a uh, but that so 
but my point is that th this is what these major corporations are doing. And so, yep. so, you know, so other ones, which people would know maybe. Well, I have a, I have a follow-up question to ask you is with these, obviously when these companies are sinking billions of dollars, it's a special type of agreement that they're making. Are they, and, and a part of annuity is, is life insurance and it's really hedging, hedging both of those with uh, large numbers. Are they buying life insurance as well? Because one of the common strategies that we can use with clients is if you have a permanent death benefit that can unlock other things like annuities or like pensions or even like market-based activities. And so are they, are these companies doing that? Or are they just, or how did, what, did, when you say you're, you're putting billions of dollars into these annuities, are, is there some kind of life insurance component to that? Well, there's mortality credits and all that stuff. So it is, it's a mortality based product, like, but it's not a true death benefit uh, product, okay. you know, where there's a lot of death benefit. It's really just a question of managing the money and uh, exactly. doing a better job. Um, it's, it's, you know, true insurance. And, um, yeah. you know, so, but some of the other banks, so the other people which are big in this, like Commerce Bank and, and, and you know, bought one and um, uh, it's just uh, UBS. Union yeah. Bank of Switzerland bought one for uh, uh, their their pension plan in the, in the UK. So so this is so you have these wealth managers. Even how about this one, Caleb? Even Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, you know, bought one last year um, or a year before for like nine hundred employees in the UK and for like half a half a billion dollars. Hmm. So why are they doing this? Yeah. Because the, because the life comes to better managing the risk. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Um, let's, let's talk about the evasion of passive investing and can you explain what that means first and foremost? And then let's talk about what you actually mean by that. Well, essentially what has happened, uh, we've gone from an active management model with mutual funds in the United States and you think of your traditional, um, money managers like fidelity or, uh, Bill Miller from Leg like Mason, the legacy managers, they were essentially buying and selling stocks and, and really um, just, you know, in picking and choosing. Sometimes they winners, sometimes they weren't. So, so essentially that was pretty much the market um, the way it was. And now back around, I think in the late 70s or 80s, I forget where um, it is, the Wells Fargo first came up with the idea of just um, creating a portfolio just of the index, just and made uh, like an S&P 500 index. And, but it was, Wells Fargo first started, but it was Jack Vogel from Vanguard who ran with that and saying, look, the only way you can really control this, you can't control the market. So let's just throw everything into an index and, and we'll get rid of all the costs. Okay. Which is true to a certain extent, but conversely, you're creating this monster where there's no accountability and there's no, um, you know, it, it's getting too big. And even Jack Bogle before he died, and I became friends with Jack Bogle before he died, but then he went to darker me, but for a couple of reasons. But if you um, if you put all your money in investments, you, you theoretically reduce your costs, but it's not necessarily so. Um, and, but also you, I have it from a, um, and there's a guy I'm gonna be talking to, a guy by the name, Mike Green, for your listeners out there from Logica Funds, who's more of an expert on this than me. Um, and I've, I've done some YouTubes on this. Uh, but so you have these, these companies like Vanguard, State Street, and, and um, BlackRock. You know, they own, they own just, so, they're huge giants, and there's no corporate confidence. Yeah. So, so it's, um, and the thing is that they're not hedged in a downturn. So, um, you know, when the next correction comes, uh, and it will, the people who are all in their 401ks, it's, it's, it's like Hotel California money, Caleb. You can get in, but you can never get out. And so, so it's, it's, a, it's a huge risk. Uh, so, uh, so I'm trying to, so I hear what you're saying. In, in other words, because of these big companies, they, is it, are you saying this is just another way for the small investor with the Robin Hood app? They just don't stand a chance to competing with these big, big, it's really blocks of capital of, and control. Like they have so much control that they could, they could totally swing a market. Yeah. And the, the thing is that there's no corporate governance either. There's no accountability. And so, you 
you know, I give people the example of GE, you know, and where yeah. GE was a $590 billion company, um, you know, 20 years ago. Now it's like down a hundred million, a billion. Uh, but, you know, uh, but, you know, their largest shareholder was Vanguard for a number of years. And um, there was never, no one say, you know, it lower the compensation. It's, they're passive. I call them communists. So this is kind of like the money goes in and there's no accountability. And, um, but the guy, this guy, Mike Green, Logic of Funds, um, people um, want more on it. He does it. He's, the guy's brilliant. Um, but so you have essentially, and there's a real problem in case there is a correction, you can't get out. Um, yeah, it, it, it is. It is super interesting. What what would your basic overall recommendation be for people that are stuffing a ton of money in a 401k, a stock account, have Robin Hood? Like, what are your, what is your, what is your thoughts? I know you don't, each situation is different. You're not giving financial advice, but what is your know. overall like thoughts when, when someone's, their whole strategy is to, to invest in the, in the market? I'm not, I'm, a, I'm a capitalist, Caleb, okay? Um, um, but what we have to say is not capitalism, it's crony capitalism. And what I'm saying is that people are just being forced into it. Yep. And um, and it's and to me, it's tragic. It, it's, it's a moral issue. And um, and it's, um, I think maybe there was, remember the movies, there was the other people's money and, um, um, and I'm not saying anything new, but it was actually, um, Louis Brandeis, who became, a, I think, a judge in the Supreme Court, he wrote a book, the classic book, Other People's Money, in, in 1914. And so what is happening uh, is the same thing again, but it's just a lot more sophisticated. Yeah. You know, so, uh, you know, and as you know, if you've, if you've read my books, is that I can't figure out these target aid funds. It's <laughs> like, in a, <laughs> you know, and I'm an RA and I'm pretty anal of this stuff. I can't figure out. They talk about glide path. So my point is, is, make it simple look at i don't know what i'm having for dinner tonight never mind what's going to happen next week or next month we just don't know yeah and so for me to say i do know it, it at best it's a it's a guess and it's you know yeah. at, at, at worst it's you know it's blasphemy or it's yeah could i, they're, could, they're, I throw, they're, could i throw something out and could you tell me where if you think i'm on something or not is i, I always try to point people back to what they actually want and so, for instance, if someone's putting their money in their 401k or something, what do they really want? Well, a lot of them would communicate, I want to be able to stop working someday and receive income. Yeah. And so, so here's the quote unquote advice that I can give somebody is start with the end in mind and talk to somebody on who can optimize the end in mind. Yeah. Is that, is that, I mean, I know that's what you do. You've written a book about that. And that's what yeah. we strive to do because again, it gets super complicated, but a lot of people are focused on the wrong metric. Yeah, it's, you know, the rate of return, rate of savings, as you know, Gail, uh, Caleb, is more important than the rate of return. I mean, that's, um, um, and if you study the large blocks of money, like I have a um, good friend of mine, Steve Church from Piscatical Research, and this is collaborated with like, another uh, actuarial firm in uh, Wilshire, not Wilshire, but, um, Oh, gee, was I'll probably remember it, but um, uh, they're down in um, Marina del Rey in California. But, um, uh, but essentially, the two collaborations, essentially, they, and they track large pools of money, three, four trillion. And, and they found that the large pension plans, which is really the only thing we can measure, and we, we can measure, um, uh, they project rates of return of seven and a half, seven point six percent, but they're only really getting about five point seven percent. So yeah. if large institutions can't get it, um, how is the retail investor going to get it? So. I think, and there's also what it called mathematics return to the mean. So mostly people um, will get you know, mean exposures, but there's always going to be outliers to this. But I'm saying for generally the population, they're not going to beat the market. Okay. Uh, I, I get through. Can I, I'm going to go on to the next question. Sure. Crypto is one of these hot topics right now. What's your two cents on, on crypto? Oh, gee was. Um, You know, I, 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 you know, I don't have all the answers. Um, I think it's going to be valid at some point, but until you have some government or some force behind it, backing it as a legitimate, like gold, um, it's almost, I don't, um, and some people I know are very, very um, behind it. I know some people made a lot of money like in Bitcoin, yeah. uh, but my, myself, I don't totally understand it. So I kind of stay away from it, but I think yeah. it is going to be something of the future. Um, uh, 
there's no question in my mind. Um, but it's just, uh, you know, gee whiz, most people should be, should, there's other issues they should be cleaning up before they get into crypto. Okay. They should be warehousing their money and life insurance and, and saving and managing debt and, you know, doing really good risk um, management before they get into this, this silly stuff. Yeah. Um, because, you know, look at Robinhood. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, they make they make money on order flow and selling options, which is options is really. Yeah. yeah. It's the, 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 so let's talk about pros of Robinhood. They're, they're giving the power to the people. The problem is they're giving power and with no, with no uh, training wheels on. And so people, they're, they're allowing people to take margin, do option trading, and options can be a great thing and it can be a terrible thing. Um, it really goes back to not, it's not the options fault, it's the investor's fault. And, um, and so with that, I think there's going to be more regulations put on apps like that. And so I think overall, we're going in a good direction. I, I love that people are, are seeing what's going on. What I get frustrated about is a lot of people, even with the, the knowledge, the, the media and a lot of these companies are getting us to focus on things that like there's, they're getting us to focus on, on fee structure, which is okay, is, which is important. They're getting us to focus on certain things like that, but they're not, they're not getting us to take a step back and saying, is this even the right way to go about it? Like we're making an assumption that all of our money should be in this asset. But what if we took a second back and, and took a step back and said, should all our money be in the asset, but all the financial gurus are just telling you ways to, you know, save money here, but you could be going down the wrong path, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah, and there's a difference between savings and investing, uh, Caleb. And the problem is, you know, in terms of savings, I mean, the United States is one of the worst in the world. I mean, yeah. everyone's better than us, the Irish, the, the French, the Dutch. Um, you know, and I'm going to give you a great example. The only really well-run pension funds in the world today, to the best of my knowledge, are the, the, are the pension plans uh, run in the Netherlands because uh, they run they run like insurance companies, like life insurance companies, and they assume a 3.5% rate of return, which is probably the realistic thing. But you're, you're in Colorado or I'm here in New Hampshire, wherever they are, they're assuming rates of return, which are ridiculous, 7.6 on an average, okay, which you're never going to get. Yeah. Um, so, um, so it's something to be said to be conservative in this stuff. And, um, and so much of this is just an illusion, but yeah. it, it feeds well into the, in, in, into the, I call it the asset management industrial complex and, um, um, and, and, and others. And, um, so, so people really have to, you know, if something, I don't know if your parents ever said this, but something sounds too good to be true. Yeah. Generally is. Right. Right. I don't love that. Cause I think you should ask questions and uncover like the, the assumptions, but yes, I 100% agree. And our, I think our whole world is propped up on some too good to be true things. Um, Barry, is there anything else that you'd like to talk about? I and mean, we talked about bull eye. We talked about de-risking how corporations are de-risking using life insurance, talking about, the problems with in just investing in the market, um, not not from the not not that the market's bad, but just like these big overall companies are um, really have a, a lot more control than we may even think. Um, is there anything else that you have been doing research on, or that you want to highlight? Well, yeah, I've been working on a book on private equity for a number of years now, and I hopefully we'll finish that this year. Um, I think um, people just need to. Um, you know, not just take my word for it, but really, you know, we uh, research themselves, you know, again, and, you know, um, uh, read books about banking, how, you know, fractions of lending really works, how these things uh, really work. And, um, you know, because um, uh, it was in the Bible, it says, my people perish due to lack of knowledge. Yeah. And that that's what I'm happy, I'm seeing now. And, and also, you know, if you want to really uh, learn how to be good in this stuff, turn off all the cable televisions, okay? Because of this show for all Wall Street, you know, so you're better off. Going, um, I live on the beach, so you're better off going for a walk on the beach than than listen to another cable television show, yeah. because it's just um, it's it's silly. It's it, it's infotainment. It's it's not yeah. concrete knowledge. Yep. I want to remind people to go back to episode 132 of Better Wolf Podcast. Listen to the first uh, time I I got to speak uh, to Barry Dykes on the podcast. Barry, how can people find your work? How can people find your books? How can people find the work that you're doing? I, I want to support your research and what you're doing for the world. Well, thank you. Yeah, just please, uh, please go to uh, my uh, website is uh, www.barryjamesdyke.com. 
and um, they go to the economic warrior tab. Yeah. And, and you'll see videos I've done with Chomsky and yeah. uh, other economists like John Kay, uh, uh, Paul Craig Roberts, um, Bill Danko, the millionaire next door. I think you had him built then. Yeah, Bill. Yes. yes. And, and Ted Benna, he was a right. friend of mine. So, right. you, know, we're, you know, we're kind of seasoned guys. So we kind of, you know, we're, you know, we believe in the same things. And, uh, um, you know, the best thing is always be to invest in yourself first, Caleb. You know that. Yep. I, I harp on it all the time because one of the one of the questions that people ask is like, well, I mean, it's really stems from anywhere. It's like, what do I do with inflation? What do I do with all these unknowns? And I'm like, you know, one thing that wades through all these unknowns is value. Value creation will always trump anything else. And, and so that's what I try to encourage people. Um, and that's why ultimately, number one, knowing our Lord and Savior, that's like the most important thing. And number two, I know how to create value. And I could pivot 100% if everything got stripped. Um, it's like understanding that that money follows value. Um, Barry, thank you. And I'm excited to continue our friendship and relationship. And I, I look, I, I'm just grateful for the work that you're doing. And so thank you for coming back on. Thank you so much, Caleb. And uh, let's keep in touch. And uh, congratulations, by the way. Thank you. It's awesome. Good for you. Thank you so much for listening to the Better Wealth Podcast. It would mean the world to me if you could hit subscribe, leave a review, and share this with the people that you know and love.